this is, this is, this is. Thanks for taking the time. Thanks for doing this kind of super last minute. Appreciate no, that. It's super cool, man. This, uh, it's good to see you again, and I'm looking forward to the show. It's going to be good. Absolutely. Be good Music for Cancer Fest in St. Therese, Montreal area. September 17th is when we're playing that Saturday, but it goes on from, I think it, it's all weekend. It's 15, 16, 17. Yeah, it starts, uh, it's pretty uh, local stuff on the 15th, but then it, even the local band's outstanding though. Uh, Mute is headlining that night. And then it gets uh, it gets a little bit busier on the Friday and then really busy on the Saturday with uh, the main lineup. So, man, it's going to be great. I mean, every band, okay, so I'm just going to get right into it. Um, one of the uh, main guys, he's like, I guess he's like head of catering or food and supply and stuff like that. He's getting married and he wants to get married during the Smashers set. So we're doing that. We're doing that. And yesterday yes. we went up for dinner with his fiance and my wife and we talked about what they wanted to do. And they're like, I don't know. You figure it out. I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> really? OK. <laughs> it wasn't like that. No, they, they, they had some ideas. But uh, the thing that they we were talking about is like Music for Cancer. It's a very special festival. People like you come up, you're being there. Apparently, you guys are there the whole weekend. You're there for three nights. That's what they told me, three days, they think. That's uh, me, no, yeah. no, we're just Our there Saturday. MXPX, we'll, we'll be there Friday, Saturday. But we're only pl planes for uh, Saturday, 17th. And there's other musicians that are there for a while. And then all of a sudden, I just went through the lineup. I was like, holy cow, oh, that's, that's that band's new band. Oh, this is, oh, those guys. Oh, wow, you know, we toured them. And it's just going to be so much fun, like... Uh, you know, Tom from Gob stayed in my mother-in-law's house for a month producing an album in Montreal, like just next door. And, you know, there's just bringing all these people together. Steve Rawls from Belvedere, I've known him for, you know, almost my entire musical career. And seeing him again will be super fun, you know, it'd be really good to see him. Uh, there's another band called uh, Bring the Light, which is... Um, they were originally called Sub. I don't know if you ever knew that band, but they were sort of a, a ska punk. Uh, they were pretty big up here. They were big up here. They were big, okay. to be honest. Okay. They did really well. They just never reached out into uh, America, but uh, those guys have a new band. So it's going to be fun. And then the organizers are, I remember they're coming to shows. I remember them coming to the Warp Tours. I remember when Jay first had this idea. It was Warp Tour Montreal. He came up and he said, what do you think if I started this festival called Music for Cancer? I was like, oh man, that's great, do it. I mean, like, I'll, I'll help you as much as I can, you know, but, you know, with, with suggestions and stuff, but he did it. I didn't, I, I can't take any credit other than being there when he asked me and like, go for it, you know? Like, yeah. He did it. He built this really cool festival and that's uh, entering its, I guess it's 12th year, maybe third. I don't even know what year it's in. I, I, yeah, I don't really know. That's hard to he, say with all the COVID. I think this is the fourth year of it being an outdoor festival. Is that correct? Like, since they kind of, like, have the big stage? I mean, maybe the big stage, but, you know, with COVID again, I don't really know yeah. <laughs> how many years they lost. I know they lost a couple there, but mm -hmm. uh, same thing, you know, like, you see that with all those fests. Um, but, uh, yeah, we love it. I, whatever. They, they, were, they were so excited about the festival coming back at this dinner that I went to, and it was really fun. So I'm I'm really excited. My wife's super excited. She actually... She hasn't gone to, just because of COVID and not being able to have babysitters coming over, mm -hmm. you know, she hasn't done many shows. So this, we, this is good. She's going to go out and uh, have a great time. So yeah, she's I've, really excited to see her. And she's a big fan. <laughs> awesome. That'll be great. I think before, hopefully the weather hasn't turned too cold by then, September 17th. It should be good. It should be like nice and chill. And I think. I think we're getting the extended fall. I think it's going to be absolutely perfect. You know what? I'm just going to check. Let me just see. Because it's, awesome. it's probably going to be in Celsius. Uh, <laughs> well, for pe people wondering, you know, those tickets, you know, the the profits go towards cancer research. So, every, you know, everybody jokes about music no. for cancer. It shouldn't be against cancer. It's like, yeah, yeah, that's what it's. It's for cancer research, right? Like, that just doesn't sound as good on a, on a <laughs> festival headline. <laughs> Hey man, the guys, you know, when, when I first met him, he could, he could barely speak English. So, I mean, you know, he, he did it with regardless of that. And, uh, the festival's great. I mean, everyone, the, the, the entire, almost the entire staff is volunteer. You know, they're just doing it to make yeah. something happen and try to create some money. And you know, last year they, uh, despite it being a scaled back version, they still raised quite a bit of money to help out, um, one of the local 
hospitals. It was the children's cancer unit, I believe, that they really put the money towards. So it's it's a good cause. We need more stuff like that. Great. Yeah, absolutely. Always. Um, I played, I, I want to say the first year or, or something like that. It was in a club. It was small. It was mostly acoustic acts. Yep. And <clears throat> that was a blast. Like I had so much fun. Um, hanging out with all the locals, uh, you know, uh, and then fast forward Goldfinger, I played bass with Goldfinger. And so yep. we played, I want to say 2018, 2019, yeah. somewhere in there. Yeah. I think that was just before the pandemic. So my dog wants out. I'm just going to walk over here. Like, sure. Patient. No worries. He's like standing there patiently. Good girl. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah the, the, I remember the Goldfinger one because I think our horn players played for you guys and I, I tagged along and watched the show. It was really, uh, it was really fun. Yeah, great show. yeah that, was, that was a lot of fun. So yeah, we're, we're uh, looking forward to this year. Yeah, Montreal, it's always, you know, it's always one of the, one of the main places in the world that I remember because it's just so great for punk rock. It's always like, we came there first time in 1997. And it was wow. a snow jam tour. Do you remember? Did you ever oh, yeah, go to any I, of those? We, did it. we only, we were on the outside, the peripheral of the punk scene then. We weren't really involved with that thing. We started in uh, 98 was the first one we got. That's when I met Fletcher. It's a great day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Always a great day. So your first one was 97. That was a big one. That was uh, 88 Fingers Louie. Were they on it? That sounds right. And, and Satanic Surfers. Satanic Surfers. Uh, Good Riddance. Good riddance, yeah, yeah. And there were probably a few others. One eighty two, were they on it? Because I know they did. They weren't one on of the first threes. No, they weren't on that year, or at least not. Yeah, they weren't on that year. I um, think they did one of the first ones, and they were like way down the list on the uh, the bands that were touring. They were sure. Just starting, just starting to happen. I mean, yeah, with the, being our our first time, we were just starting out too. Really, I mean, we we'd gone to Vancouver, Canada, a bunch of times early in our career and that was almost like a local show because it's really a three-hour drive right so it's like going to portland or vancouver bc but going to montreal that's like going to a different country for real like going to vancouver bc is like okay you're just like in in um, it's the same it's like you're just over a border and there. the money's different <laughs> yeah, that's all right. but uh you go to montreal and it's like for us it was it was like going to europe we're like we're in europe yeah. this is europe this is crazy That's and here. yeah yeah we we got picked up in in um in this van and uh man i'm gonna space on the guy's name i i do remember his name i just can't think of it now but he he, he was in a band called blood sausage oh uncle costa uh, costa it, costa. It costa so costa picks us up and <laughs> you know we're crazy. like we're pretty young at this point. I mean, I don't yeah. think I was even 21 at the time. Yeah. So <laughs> maybe just turned 21. So yeah, it, it was early years and Costa was our, our guest or our, our, our guide, you know, and, and he brought us to like cool, like little diners and we ate breakfast and yeah. you know, what's funny is I don't think we even had, we probably did have poutine, but I don't remember having poutine on that first trip. It was all about uh, drinking you know, and eating, you know, eating at these diners, these weird, weird food that he was into. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Blood sausage yeah. was one of them. Oh, but, man. That band was heavy. Yeah, they were. <laughs> <laughs> one but of the guys, the bass player opened, uh, and he still has it, a really good record store called Sound Central in, uh, in Montreal. Super cool shop. That's awesome. But I think Cost has moved out of the scene. Okay. still around occasionally. I saw him a few years ago. Um, yeah in Montreal. It was like, oh, hey, what's up? Uh, he'll, do some, uh, he'll do some like uh, production side of stuff a bit more. But sure, sure. But, um, I don't know I any that. of the, the local politics. All I know is he picked us up in 1997. <laughs> hey, man, that's cool. <laughs> you know, it's great. But um, you yeah, remember like Paj Williams from that crew and maybe Nancy Ross. Absolutely. Was, Those are two good friends yeah. and and still anytime i see them it's it's like a family reunion and they they took care of us you know they were Put great so much of their life into that scene and and developing it uh, you know i can only thank them for everything absolutely that, that scene you know they caused the whole snow jam thing i mean they you know page and his efforts definitely instrumental in breaking making punk rock what it still is here in montreal you know he made it so much fun 
by doing these snow jam tours and he that that what he did you know those snow jam still like it, it set the base for kind of you know the the punk rock festival um culture that we have here and it really really had a huge impact and i i'm you know i hope he hears this maybe he'll be he'll be blown away i'll probably cry I'm probably making him cry right now if he heard it yeah i mean <laughs> it, 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 in, a, in a lot of ways they were the pioneers for warped yep. tour and they were. you know i mean Warp Tour didn't seem like a weird thing when I saw it because we had already been on Snow Jam, you know? So it's like, yeah, this is okay. Everybody has, each country probably should have one of these. And and sure enough, there's deconstruction over in Europe and there's, uh, what do they have in Australia? They had probably a few oh, things. There was Warp Tour, of course, but. What was it called? It's not, uh, oh, wow. Oh, I can't, I can't remember now. Summer, I can't remember. But I remember. Well, the, there's, uh, Being uh what is it summer summer uh summer something in japan that's not really a tour summer though sonic summer sonic yeah and yeah that was a big one i don't know if it's still around it's it is anyway. it's gone really pretty mainstream or maybe we were mainstream at the time and that's why we it played might, <laughs> it might have been punk rock was considered mainstream yeah but, you know yeah cool. so let me ask you do you remember yeah. a place you probably do uh a bar called biff tech yeah it's still open still open Still the same thing. It's barely it, it, changed. I'm not kidding. How is that even possible? I, I love that. My so, bass player uh, got hired there for a while. It's probably about a, well, now it's probably a decade ago. And uh, Nancy of Nancy and Page, mm -hmm. Greenland, she would work Monday night shift there. And she had Dave come in and clean out all the pipes. And he said it was so gross. But now they're all <laughs> clean. They're clean now. Sweet. Good. But back then, he was like, man, you wouldn't believe what we were drinking. <laughs> Yeah, because music for cancer is coming up. I was trying to think about like some of these early memories, and one of those was Biff Tech. And I was like, why did we go there? I mean, I know everybody, it wasn't us. It was like they all brought us there. And now that you kind of jogged my memory, yeah, Nancy worked there, you know, now and again. And, and so like all the bands, I remember when we first started going there, it wasn't as packed. And then over the years, it was just every, all the fans knew, go to Biff Tech after the show. That's where all the bands are going to be. I started going there and I remember uh, it was before, you know, before I was into, it was before 97 for sure, because when did REM start getting big? Was that like 88? I mean, weren't they always big? I don't know. I, don't know. <laughs> I know they weren't, but, but. I remember sneaking into the bar and yeah. I just, just moved there and one of the guys from the band, Mike, uh, well, I can't remember, not the lead singer, the bass player, whatever his name was, he was there. I was like, holy cow, this is the coolest place in the world. <laughs> so wow. I never left. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, it, you know, across the street, they had like the pizza shop that sold, sold slices for like a toonie or something like that. Yeah. Uh, so you could always eat if you were, you know, getting too drunk or whatever. The, the, the annoying part was the fact that you had to take either the train or a cab to get there if you were downtown at a show. Yeah, it was a little further because it was sort of in a different part of town that didn't have any any of the live venues like uh, there's there's eventually a couple were up there but they're all gone it's uh it's further up that street the area called the main um you know, sorry or mile end past the main was where there's other venues again but most of them are like you said they're more downtown like foofs and club soda and metropolis all those mm -hmm. well what it's called now m telus it's now uh, been a little commercialized but it's still the same venue yeah uh, <laughs> so so biff tech if i remember correct me if i'm wrong but does it mean best steak? Pretty much, it's pretty much, it's like, uh, it just means steakhouse. Effect. Steakhouse. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. Biff Tech Steakhouse. That's what it means. You Not know, best. Um, it never had any steak. I think it, <laughs> yeah. the only thing it had was, it had popcorn. I think it had popcorn. I remember there being popcorn everywhere. I actually haven't been there in a while. I mean, I go by it, it's always open, but it's not like what it used to be. It's not the... It's not the scene yeah. after hours bar. The bands aren't going. More of them are still going to Fuffs. I would say that's more common as bands will show up at Fuff Fun. And that's um, the down, that's like right downtown. Yeah, it's kind of gothy, punky. Yeah, yeah, punk I've been there. Club quite a and I think Fuffun. It used to be called the Fuffun Electric, which would be the electric butt cheeks or something like that. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> Fuffun is a slang term for butt cheeks. So. Montreal has the best names. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I didn't know that at the time, but. Uh, <laughs> And it's still open, and they're still doing tons of punk shows, man. I mean, that's where most of them are. Most of the indie punk stuff goes through Foofs. Foofs. Uh, yep. Foofs. Fluffy yeah. butt cheeks. Yeah, we should get you back there. 
I'll talk to Tom. Yeah. Yeah, talk to Tom. Uh, well, I mean, we're obviously here. So where else do people play? Like, there's is La Medley still around? Or is that it's gone? gone? It's gone. It's now condos. Yeah. Condos. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's, um, <laughs> that happens a lot. But we have a... We still have a Corona Theater is really nice. Um, Metropolis, which is a bigger place, about 2300. It's now called the M Talis. Club Soda, our office is just above Club Soda, which is right beside M Talis, which is right beside Foof's, is about a thousand capper. That's really good. You've probably played Club Soda, haven't you? We've played Club Soda for Pooza. It's kind of funny. It's, a, it's not a great name for a club, is it? It's not really Club fun. Soda. It's so pretty. It's, uh, it's like a middle of the road. See the, it's like a dad joke. Yeah. Um, like Metropolis is that? It's a big venue. I think we played that before. Oh, yeah. I mean, there must have been. Unless something there's like that. how how many is that? What's the cap on Metropolis? Like two thousand. I think it's twenty three hundred. So there's a big main floor, and then there's a nice big. Uh, yeah. Man. For sure, I saw Beck there. I you know the band we the band was there like a night early, and we saw Beck, and probably because Nancy and Padge were doing Padge. the show at the time. Um, but this was, I, I would assume this is around 2000 or something like that when we were really yeah. coming a lot. Um, you know, the, I don't know where else besides Metropolis there would be, that would be like a thousand to 2000 to there's Olympia, but it's not used as much. And that's, that's also around 2000 and it's a beautiful venue too, but there's less shows there. I think that's where, uh, no effects is in town actually the night before our show. And I think they're playing at Olympia. Okay. And I think Lagwagon is two days before that, and I think they are at uh, Mtelis, uh, Metropolis. Okay. So busy. Metropolis. Got a lot of a lot of shows coming through. Yeah, let's get it in before before the snow sets in. Really, it's coming. <laughs> it's going to slow things down. Do people but, go I mean, to sh- uh, Do people still go to shows normally, like in the wintertime? Because up here they do. It's it's a little it's a little harder like, to to get people out, but uh, at the same time, if it's not too cold, like I mean, too cold is. Minus 10 degrees Celsius, so that's probably like 10 Fahrenheit, I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, everyone will still come out. But once you go below that, it gets a little tricky, you know. That's good. Um, and, you know, think about it. Like, when it's that cold out, it's kind of nice to go to a sweaty bar. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it's kind of fun. And, you know, you go see your friends and everyone's, you know, having a good time. So That's why you guys have coat checks when it gets real cold. You got to have... A nice it can be warm. frustrating at the end of a show when you're waiting for your coat. But it's uh, the worst. <laughs> it's the worst. But ultimately, the rest is all good. You know. <laughs> yeah, the rest is all. Don't think about that part. Let's not think about that. <laughs> um, yeah. So I mean, Montreal. The scene's great. You know, the it, everything's. It's actually kind of cool. What's ha- what I'm seeing right now. Um, there's some really good young punk bands starting up, and they're like, I, I use the term punk. It's not what we think of as punk, and that's what makes it punk. You know what I mean? Like they're sure. they're aggressive, loud, but it's they're blending a bit of garage, a bit of surf, and it's but it's rough and loud and and crazy. And uh, these kids were pent. I think you know we had uh, Quebec had um, full on curfew during COVID for like a good year and a half. You couldn't be out past eight thirty, nine o'clock at night. Well, you could, but you weren't supposed to. You you supposed know? Everything to. was shut down. Like no one's gonna like. It's not like. It's not like military curfew. It's more like just please just go home curfew. And there's and, nowhere uh, to go. Nothing's open. So most people abided to it for you know whatever. It's that's it's another thing. I'm, I'm, a, I don't, I'm not a politician, but uh, um, because of that, the kids didn't get out. They were stuck in their houses. You know, they were having parties in parks and stuff like that. When the bars reopened and drinking age here is 18, uh, you know, they're 18, 19 years old. They've never been to a bar before someone's friend's band's got a new punk surf band and it, it hits the city and it's just been crazy. So they just, the same band, a couple of these bands played uh, on Saturday night and I didn't get to go, but my buddy went and he said, it was insane. Like, you don't know, you don't know anything. It's totally punk. It's this, it's, it's new. And, it's, and you don't know any of the songs, but it just has that energy and you're like, got, let's bounce off energy. the walls. The, the kids aren't drinking. They're Everyone's vaping. I don't know. It seems like everyone's vaping, but they're all crazy. Like they're just getting into it, you know, full of energy, full of angst. And it's a really cool. I'm hoping it's happening in other cities because I think if it, you know, you give it a couple of years, we could see some amazing band, new bands showing up in the next couple of years. So I'm hoping for it. I, I, I have every, every f- full faith that it'll happen. Yeah. Like I, I feel like yeah. that's just what humans do. Humans find a way. 
that, that's why the lockdowns, all that is just like people are going to do what they're going to do. I get whatever, whatever side of the political ring people are on, but but yeah. no matter what, like rules. Um, you look at all the most successful people, and most of those people broke a bunch of rules to get there. Maybe not laws, but like some sort of traditional, Standard. this is how you're supposed standards, right? Standards and practices. You got to make your own, you know, you have to figure out your way of, of figuring, you know, finding your way in the world. And it's really hard to like, you know, be on both sides of that coin, you know, as, as a parent, you know, like, Hey kids, yeah. let's listen to me. But at the same time, I ain't listening to them, you know, like I ain't listening to my authorities. I got it. F them. You know, so it's, it is kind of funny, but um, I love hearing that. Like, that gives me hope. It gives me hope for me the younger generations. And, and look, bring it on. Something new. Bring it on. Be there. So yeah. That's what I like about it. And I also just like seeing these clubs that were doing, you know, four years ago before the pandemic. It was it was still great punk rock, but it was starting to get a little, little boring, you know? And now it's like full on. It's back to what I remember as a kid, you know, just showing up and going, like, what is happening? And uh, mm -hmm. it's nice to see. I hope, I hope it continues. Yeah, I think, you know, anytime you kind of like have a big change in your life, you have to break out of that somehow. And, yeah. and you know, for me, it's not necessarily like the same as these kids, but I feel like I hope that, you know, the new songs that I'm writing are going to hit just a little different, you know, and, and be like, yeah. okay, this... This feels even more true, you know, than than some of the other stuff, you know, or whatever. But like, this is just my small little corner of the world as a as a songwriter. But going out more broadly, like back into Montreal, like, uh, is is it harder and harder for for bands to get out there and play? It or do you feel like? You feel like it's like I mean it's not going to be the same. Let's just let's just put it that way. Like let's not yeah. sugarcoat. It's not going to be exactly the same as it was no. in 2019. Yeah. Um, early I, 2020, I, whatever. Um, but do you go back? You try to go back to what you've always done, or do you go? This is an opportunity to try something new. And I'm not saying try like a new style, like did yeah, ska. Yeah. But I, I just mean like, however whatever the tactics and the, the mindset that, that bands have today? I mean, I think it, it's definitely changed. There's new challenges. There's also, uh, you know, some, some good things at the same time. Um, you know, the way, the way things are getting discovered is a little different. You know, there was a good two years where, you know, there was no, you, in the olden days, you have to tour no matter what for punk rock to work, you know? And now it's, it's, it's changed a bit, um, which is good. In terms of touring, you know, up here, gas prices are up, and I, I, that's I'm not going to complain. It's just the reality of, of the situation in the world, and that just makes it even harder for these bands to, to get out. You also can't find a band van very easily anymore. There's no more Econolines anywhere. They, it's impossible to find them. So anything. many, yeah. So it, in terms of that, the logistical side, side of things, it's trickier. And a lot of people have left the music industry, you know, it, inevitably. But people are going to fill that void. There's going to be new people mm -hmm. coming in. And that's also a good thing, like you were just saying, because they're going to have new ideas and new ways of doing things. But in the intern, it's a little trickier getting that going, you know, like finding those people and, and you know, that, that moment that it's going to take these new promoters to get up to the same level of whatever professionalism, whatever you want to call it, that the, old, the other people used to do. So it's, it's different. There's definitely some challenges. But uh, like you said, um, you know, the, the pandemic has open new ways to get your band out there. And it's all related to, from social media to just, uh, you know, the, the live streaming stuff, um, more interactive uh, online sort of events where you can get to know the band and, and this kind of music. And then also the same thing with the streaming providers, they've gotten a little more cl clever in terms of allowing people to find new music because there's an appetite for that. It's not just people want to hear catalog all the time, you know? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's what we're seeing from the record label side of things that we're seeing that the new bands are getting a lot more chances than they were prior to the pandemic. Like being added to good playlists, like a band that's done no touring in the old days wouldn't get added to the new playlist. Uh, but now they are. So the that's cool. Yeah. So that's nice. So let's see that happen. Yeah. So aside from band stuff, just like life up there in Montreal, 
<laughs> Man, this has been a great summer. I mean, like we had, like everyone else, we had another, I don't know, seventh COVID wave. I don't know what it was, the, the, the other COVID wave during summer. Yeah. But it was Omicron, so it wasn't as bad up here. And you know, no one was, no one was, not as many people were dying. And uh, the, the city came alive. So it was really nice to see. You know, all of our festivals were back up and running. Um, <laughs> A lot of my buddies who used to write, run, work site for these festivals were back up and doing it again, and they were having good times, but complaining just like they used to back Always. in 2019. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> you know, because they worked their butts off, and uh, you know the crowds were out, the uh, lots of smiling people everywhere. It's really nice to see. Like uh, I needed it so badly. I, we were, we were. It was a tough two years up in in Montreal. You know, we were hit really bad with COVID, and it stayed. And then we had a lot of government. Uh, uh, whatever you want to call it, you know, restrictions, oversight, control. Restric- yeah, control for I sure. Say exactly what they did, but anyway. Um, yeah, but, uh, well, a lot of politicians just want to be seen as doing something because yeah. if they don't do something, then they get blamed for it even more. So, okay. but it's just. I do yeah. have to lend it to our to our politicians for that. They did more than other politicians did, even when the public was saying no, no, no. They just please no. Out. They're like, we're not, we're not changing our minds for votes, which is. Uh, pretty well, unique you know like they were like no we're right you're wrong um they ended up being but, wrong but okay <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but most politicians so are but it started you could see the the power of government starting to wane a bit up here when certain things were said you know like i think our premier he, at some point he said uh well yeah we're gonna we're gonna relax uh you know this this and that on this day because that's commonly the day that all quebecers put their boats into the water and most of the population is like, what? What? <laughs> you got a you got a yacht? Yeah. <laughs> so it's this funny thing. So it's been a disconnect. But read the room, to, dude. Read the room. Yeah. yeah, read the room. Come on. Um, when it comes down to it, though, I mean, it, it's I, I'm glad to say that it's behind me, and I've I have, you know I'm moving forward, and you know I'm going to be safe and all that stuff. And if I get sick, I'll probably wear a mask and stay away from people. But uh, I don't think it's going to stop anything I do uh, in terms of music and in living my life beyond that, you know? Yeah, so, yeah. I think most That's people it. are in that frame of mind. Just got to live. Uh, got to live with it like and said, be careful. Like but said, yeah. you know, we have we had so many songs about not conforming by the Planet Smashers. Like, so many, don't conform, don't yeah. conform. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I conformed pretty good in the last two years. That's what I was life. saying about a lot of punk rockers. Like, they're, like, not, I mean... I don't mind if you conform, but like at least question a little bit. Make it look good. Come on. Come on, people. Come on, my yeah. people. Yep. We, we did do that. I mean, I, you know, we, we did it, but uh, I'll be playing some songs. We were playing some live streams. And I'm playing a couple songs. I'm like, man, this song is, sounds, it could really be adopted by the anti vax campaign. Yeah. <laughs> so. Oh, funny. But it, it's weird to change everything. You know, I see my kids, they're little, little confused. Like I, just at the playground today, my kids are great too. Uh, the school's pretty big, so this campus only goes to grade four. And literally only the grade four is probably remembered pouring into the schoolyard and just running and playing. Now all the kids go and they all line up. I'm like, mm. we got to get these kids playing, man. we got to get these kids running around. This is yeah. not right. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, the, what I'm afraid is uh, it kind of scares me that some of the policies that were enacted during the, the lockdown part of the yeah. pandemic Yep. are going to be slow to change just because of bureaucracy, just because of people being afraid to be blamed or, yeah. you know, or whatever. And I get that's a very real thing. I mean, that's, but man, I hope that, that we can all kind of go, okay, let's reassess yeah. what we actually know now because it's constantly changing and make some decisions based on what we know now, not based on our bad decisions. Sure, let's, you know, whatever, but let's let's learn from it. Let's not use those. Yeah. Yeah, no, I just agree. Um, so let's hopefully, hopefully we'll see some good leadership. I don't know, maybe it's possible. <laughs> yeah, I gotta, I gotta uh, download a arrive can app. Oh yeah, you do to yep. get into Canada. I haven't done it yet, but you have. I have plenty of time. I, I gotta download mine too because I'm actually going to the states next weekend. We're playing in Denver. That's for- right. A single show. We just got our immigration yesterday. I was getting really nervous. I was like, "Oh man, this is, we're gonna we're either gonna have to sneak in like when we were 16, or uh, or not go." But, Allegedly. Uh, yeah. 
<laughs> so tell okay okay i did hear about this show i was excited for you guys i was excited for people in in denver to to get to yeah. see you guys so uh what's up with it so what are the dates we're, we're opening for five iron frenzy right downtown at the ooh, what's it called i think it's gothic theater I gothic that's what it's called great yeah. spot we played there um, it's our first time actually playing denver <laughs> which is pretty lucky we played with five iron frenzy um, on Warp Tour, I had probably early 2000s, and uh, they were on the Maurice stage. I don't even remember the names of the stage. Maurice, Maurice. and yeah. we, we were on the Kevin Says, the Kevin Lyman stage, which Kevin Says, I think it was called. Kevin yeah. Says, yeah. And it was back then. It was really not much of a stage. It was just the it was the uh, the box stage, like the the crate stage. And we'd play, and we weren't very well. You know, we no one really knew us, but fought, we were really always. We'd always try. We'd ask Warped Production. We'd be like. Um, any way you can make us play after Five Iron, because we those two stages would be going back and forth. And they did it a bunch of times, especially in Florida. So Five Iron Friends, we would play, and they'd have a good crowd. And then when they were done, they'd go, hey, if you like Scott, just stick around. Perfect. <laughs> are going on. And it was so nice of them, and we became friends after that. And then we never played again. And you know, 20 years go by, and we're finally going to get a chance to play together in their hometown for their CD launch. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm really excited. They've They've asked us a few times, and and uh, it's never been possible, but they made it happen. And we're going to go down and we're going to do everything. We're going to be out for two nights. We're coming on Friday. Um, you're going to try to see those guys and, and, and hang out with them a bit. And uh, I hear Denver is a great town, really good food. <laughs> yeah, great food, great people, great, great ska town, to be honest. Like, they love music. They love punk rock. They love ska. Uh, it's, it's always been good. Five Iron Frenzy, excited. great people. There you go. Yeah. And, uh, I, I look forward to seeing them again. I mean, we're all going to be 20 years old, or I don't think I've seen them since, because they don't come to Canada. You know, it's it's something that just hasn't happened. Yeah. Uh, it's surprising, because they could do very well up here. So, maybe. Well, maybe. we'll talk, talk a little more about the immigration process. You know, you don't know what it's like necessarily to, to go into Canada, but what's it like as a Canadian band coming into the U.S.? A little harder. I mean, I got to be honest, this time was actually easier. I was sure it was going to be really hard, but this was actually easy, probably the easiest one I've ever done. Um, but in the olden days, uh, you know, you got to pay, you have to join the union. So you, you join the AFM. I don't know if you're a member of the AFM. No. There you go. The only reason to join the AFM is to get your immigration processed. And it's about, you know, for a, a, our band, the Smashers, six people, about two grand to join the AFM. And then you got to pay for an AFM letter saying that you are part of the member of the union. Mm -hmm. Then you got to get a permit for the U.S. Homeland uh, Department of whatever Homeland Department of whatever it's called, Department Security. of Homeland Security. Yeah. There it is. Yeah, and that's not so bad. It's about five hundred U.S. if you do it way in advance, and in the end, it's probably about three grand when you're all done, um, and that's if you hold all your stuff in advance. But that'll be good for up to a year. Now, in theory, you're not allowed to add shows in that year. Everything should be contracted and done. You're not already allowed to do that. Okay, but Immigration has been, I, I've only heard about it twice, maybe a band, you know, being told, hey, you're playing on a, you're playing a show that wasn't part of your permit. Um, I think realistically, they realize that, you know, the, that, you know, the bands, the band is, these people are good. They're not bad people. They're coming, they're going to work. Uh, the promoters know they have to remit taxes to the government. And then that's, you're, they're good, you know, so I, I don't think it, it's viewed as a high priority uh, situation yeah. problem. So that's it. You, you yeah. do that, and then, and then you got to go. You know, we're we're going to be going on Thursday or Friday to go see the uh, the U.S. Immigration and Customs people. They like giving it to you, man. There's they give you the evil eye, and they're like, <laughs> "Planet Smashers, hey, you look more like the cockroaches." <laughs> <laughs> Are you you violent people, huh? <laughs> Make you cry. Um, and then they or then they'll, and there'll be one nice guy's like, "Hey, man, what kind of guitar are you play?" I'm like, "Fender." He's like. I like fenders. I'm like, oh man, should I be nice to him now? Can we talk about guitars? Or are we are we still doing this immigration thing? And then he keeps on talking about guitars. So you start talking about guitars, and he slides in an immigration question. On yeah, <laughs> they try to bring your guard down a little bit, you know. It's quite serious, but you know, it for for a reason. You know what's funny? Uh, when I left, when we left, uh, one one time we left Montreal. It was probably like the first or second time. We were definitely at Biff Tech the night before yeah. our flight, and. I didn't smoke weed back then, by the way. So I was clean. I walked through security and I got flagged. And they're like, a dog no. sniffed you. You smell like marijuana, blah, blah, blah. Just tell, and they try to let your guard down. Like, hey, it's okay. It's okay if you have a little bit. We'll, 
not a big deal. Just tell us. You're going to be in a lot more trouble if you don't tell us. <laughs> just like, I swear I was just with people, I, you know, at this bar, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't have it. I didn't do it. When you guys are flying, you clear customs and immigration in Montreal. Um, yeah. Like you effectively do it there. So when you come back, it's nice and easy just to, to speed up travel, air travel. I mean, and it's kind of nice that they did that. Um, but it must be weird, you know, like like you just said, one minute you're downtown Montreal, next minute you're talking to U.S. immigration. Like there was no mm-hmm. no chance for a little breath of air, <laughs> fresh air, to be accurate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, they do remind you. They don't really do that kind of thing. They, it's more of a reminder. It's like, just got to remind you, weed is illegal in, in America. So mm-hmm. if you got any, you know, get rid of it. <laughs> right, because it's federally legal in Canada. So you can travel with it everywhere, right? Yeah. It's, you can Even on planes? Weed. Yeah, but you're not, I don't think you're supposed to, uh, you can't pull it out. You can't, anything. right, you're, okay. You're, officially, you're not even allowed to do gummies or anything like that on the flights. So you're not supposed to, but... Yeah, no. Actually. I've done you know, a little bit. You know, funny, I've, I've told this story a long time ago on the podcast, but I'll tell a short version for you because it is kind of funny. Yeah. Uh, I was flying to Australia, and I want to say it was probably like, it was, well, obviously it was either Goldfinger or MXPX, but it was probably Goldfinger because it was just 2013, like right when I was starting to work with Goldfinger. Yeah. And I got on a flight. It was connecting to San Francisco, and then to Sydney. Yep. And okay, cool. So I have these edibles. I'm like going to save them for San Francisco. And when I get on the plane to Australia, I'll take them and I'll be like high as a kite the whole time and it's sleep and everything. Brutal. Instead, my flight got delayed. They are like, you can't make this flight to San Francisco. We're going to put you on a flight to Vancouver and it leaves right now. Go. And I have these yep. edibles. I'm like, we're going to Vancouver, BC. I'm, uh, going through customs when I get there. So I, oh, oh, oh. Yep. I eat this, you know, edible oh, and it hits me right when we land. Cause it's like 45 minute flight <laughs> and I go, I'm going through customs and, or immigration. And I am, I feel like, I feel like Frodo when he, when he puts the ring on and he sees Mordor and it's just like, whoosh, all this like noise and and the the immigration officers asking me all these questions and i'm just yeah. like be cool man be cool <laughs> i made it through hey right on good <laughs> I, hope, I hope some of it lasted for the flight because that's a long flight <laughs> yeah i i don't remember i guess it did <laughs> yeah right on good 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 yeah so you know um that's kind of cool i wonder if they would have cared i mean back then they probably 2013 yeah it wasn't legal yet yeah so, yeah that would be different been yeah oh well now it's not. It's kind of nice. It's Cost like you want to tell people. them, but you, you just know it's like a bad idea. <laughs> you know it. what? I'm so high. Right now. Yeah. <laughs> Son, be quiet. Be quiet. Stop talking Stop. to me. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I am going to be, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to this border crossing. I'm always super nervous. <laughs> like, <laughs> Well, how is it for you guys? Like when you come in, you're landing. Yeah, you, you're landing and you have... You have nothing to worry about. You're nothing playing. to worry about. Oh, good. Yeah. I'm not bringing anything with me. We'll yeah. be all right. <laughs> yeah, you'll be totally okay. I mean, you know, I think the only thing they might get picky about with the American bands coming in is merch. Sometimes yeah. they don't like when the merch is from a non-NAFTA country, so not made or printed in Canada, America, or Mexico, or mm, mm. Chile, something like that. I right. A couple of, but, uh yeah, sometimes sometimes you hear about bands getting like all their merch taken away. It hasn't happened in a long time. We're and getting normally it's, you just pay more. You pay more. That's it. Yeah, they they tax you and stuff. We're getting most so, of our merch printed in Montreal or in Canada somewhere. It's probably a little cheaper. I would yeah, say. you don't have to pay for shipping as much, or at least not international shipping and and all that. That's a good point. I just realized I didn't make anything for Denver. Oh well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm like, how did that happen? Pack a oh, duffel. Man. See how it but, goes. Uh, but it's nice. Like I said, uh, we're, our immigration is good until like end of June next year now. So we're okay. We just have to, you know, not do anything stupid and come in. Be good. Yep. We'll be fine. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so, you know, you might be able to get like one shirt printed in a week in Denver. Yeah. One shirt. Now you've got one. some work to do. <laughs> I got some. I got to get on. 
hey, hey, hey. Yeah, you know what? That's a good one. I, you know, it's not a bad idea, but uh, it would make things much easier. You know, having merch at a show. What a, what a concept. Yeah, I think I'm going to look that up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, spent, I mean, it's worth it. It's worth it. Yeah. Reach out to the five iron guys. They'll set me, they'll set me to the right people. Leonore's husband runs a screen printing business. Are you serious? Yeah. Okay. Well, there you go. Just that makes it. Didn't think of it until now. Quite a bit easier. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> That's awesome. Now, if I don't do it, if I forget right after this, uh, there's no excuse. But uh, otherwise, I got to sneak it in. You don't want to do that when you're crossing in for the first time processing a work permit. What's in the bag, son? Uh, uh, <laughs> Extra <yeah>. hoodies? <laughs> Promotional items? Yeah. <laughs> we, had, we were flying into some, I think it was Indonesia or some sort of like Southeast Asian country. It was like an island type area, very tropical tiny little airport so it wasn't it wasn't jakarta or anything like that some really tiny airport and we were going through and we had just come from another show and we had each had like two or three bottles of liquor in our bags yeah because we're just like let's not drink this now because we have a flight super early let's just take it to you know the next place and enjoy and they ended up like taking half of it like there was like no you have a limit blah 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 so like we could take oh. half the liquor and they, they i bet they were just taxing us probably so they could have a little something something yeah 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 i i kind of i admire that <laughs> hey as long as you let us have some <laughs> yeah, come on. i mean there's been times where i've forgotten that i'll have a bottle of something in my bag and domestically like i'm flying home from toronto once and uh i was like they were like oh we have to take that i'm like how did i forget that you know i can't bring a bottle of wine on the plane i totally forgot it was weird and i'd be like can you promise me you'll drink that and they're like we can't we have to uh we have to toss it i'm like come on you can't even just like it's like no i'm like okay 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 so i feel bad but, you uh, know the the worst sin is showing up in australia with a banana or an apple like anything yeah, raw you can't do that or uh, yep yeah. You know, you can't actually bring, you can't, it's the same side. I can't bring oranges into like, if I'm flying to Florida, you can't have an orange on you. Right. Unless it still has the sticker on it. I wonder, is that internationally or is that all, okay, international? I wondered. I, I've fl- flown into Florida a lot and it's never, it's never been no an issue. No one's ever said, hey, what are you doing with that orange? What's up with that orange? <laughs> <laughs> but one time I did, I think I had an orange and my wife had an apple and she had pulled the sticker off the apple because she was already eating it. And she's like, but it's from America. And she's like, you, you, the guy's like, you, you pulled the sticker off? And she's like, yeah. And she's like, mm, damn. can't bring it. Sorry. There might be some evil bug in that core. Um, anyway, whatever. That's, that's something. I mean, our, the equivalent of, uh, of what you're talking about there, we were coming back from Prague. And I think back then, you know, the, it was a long time ago. It was probably like late 90s. Um, and we found out about absinthe and the real thing. Oh, yeah. So we all, had, we all had absinthe on us. I don't know why we didn't check it or anything, but we got in. No one, no one stopped us with the absinthe. Nice. I guess we bought it afterwards. But that was, yeah, that was strong stuff. Yeah, I got, <laughs> I got some absinthe from Europe uh, yeah. years ago. It's not as good if it's not as good homemade for me. Like I, I liked it when I had it at the bar, like how they yeah, did yeah. it. But and I was like, like the spoon, <laughs> the sugar, yeah. all that stuff. Yeah, it's really something. Warm. But, uh, yeah, it's really strong absinthe. Uh, Have you gotten? Like, have you oh, yeah. hallucinated from absinthe? Oh, yeah. We all did that night. Really? It was in Prague, and it was like, one guy ordered three pizzas. He kept on asking for, he wanted, he, he asked, he, it was a Sicilian pizza, but it was in Czech, so he couldn't really order it properly. And he, <laughs> yeah. he looked at it and said, and he, tra- he translated it. I guess maybe we had some internet or something where someone told him, Sicilian, okay, that'll be like Italian. Okay, that'll be good. And he ordered it, and there's all like little anchovies all over it. He's like, ah! And he didn't get. <laughs> They're alive. Because <laughs> he was so messed up. He's like, maybe they didn't hear me right. I want the, I want the Sicilian. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that <laughs> is. Oh Finally my god. He <laughs> was pretty messed up. That's hilarious. Well, anyway, it was a good time. But, I've, uh, <laughs> I have so many stories of, 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 uh, being so excited to eat yeah. a meal. Like one of, one of the main ones was, was we were on tour with Bad Religion, and we showed up in Norway starving yep. like it's been a long day long night that night tom and i our guitar player go and have dinner at the hotel and i'm like because nothing's open and i'm just like looking through this menu going like i have no idea what anything I'm is yeah. I'm like i kind of want a hamburger and I, I look at this like flesh thing and i'm like oh that's that looks like hamburger it was pate it was just like this hump of pink meat 
just a giant pink meat pate thing. And I'm just like, oh, my God. Come on, man. I just wanted some comfort food, you know? <laughs> pate. Pate. Like whale beluga pate or something. Yeah, crazy. I have no idea what it was, but I didn't eat it. I, I don't know what I ate. I ate, like, an apple or I found something, but maybe some fries or something, but... Yeah. Um, did, your, did Tom have a, a full header? He figured something. No, he doesn't eat beef. So, like, okay. he was like, I'm not ordering that. And so yep. he, like, somehow got something good. Oh, but um, your, your Prague story reminded me of when I, one of the, I've been there a few times, but one of the times I was there, we were eating at a restaurant. It was, like, this venue. Like, Prague is wild. Like, I don't yes, remember the name time. of the venue, but the artwork kind of looked like, Alien, the movie, um, yeah. the, the aesthetic of the, the spaceships and the alien creatures. And it just looks like that artwork. Uh, R. I. R. L. Geiger, or I don't know if I'm saying his name right, but the, the artist. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, know, the remember. venue looked like that, but then it, there was a big building and one of the floors was a restaurant. It was eat, you know, so we were eating and I look over and there's a guy just rolling up. He's got a pile of marijuana just rolling up yeah. joints just in the restaurant and i'm just like damn i, I envy you because <laughs> you probably can't even do you can't do that necessarily in even in canada in public because it's it's legal but it's not like you're not supposed to be doing that roll it on the table of your at denny's yeah, yeah. you kind of like uh you know bringing your old bottle of beer in and sort of pouring yourself some cups of it at the restaurant but i mean that's pretty cool the other cool thing about prague is Stuff was so cheap, and it, it, I don't know if it still is. It's been a while since we played there, but I remember, uh, you know, you get your per diem. Mm -hmm. That's an artist. You have your per diem, and you're, you know, we ours wasn't very good. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> in Prague, you could stretch it really well. I just remember that. I was like, I still got per diem. This is crazy, man. <laughs> Let's get another beer. Yeah, so. yeah, it's great. I lo I loved it in Prague. It's just got a good vibe. Like the people are cool. It feels sort of dangerous, but it's didn't seem it wasn't yeah. actually dangerous. I don't know. Yeah. But um, I mean, uh, good, but good punk festival over there. Uh, Mighty Sounds. I don't know if you've ever played mm, that one. But I haven't done see, that. Uh, we played it a couple times, and it's it comes out of uh, similarly similarly like the Nancy and, and Page thing. It's like young dudes that did the small punk rock shows that are now doing a, a festival once a year. Mm -hmm. It's a good one. Anti Flag, I think, just did it this year. But yeah, it's pretty cool. So I'll ask you this because you you do Pusa Fest. Like, how yeah. stressful does it really get? Like, comparatively, punk show. And then moving on up to like a festival, like is the stress level like triple? It's way worse. Yeah, I'd even say more than triple. I mean, like this last Pusa wasn't too bad because we kept it indoors because we weren't at that time. We didn't know where the pandemic was going and it was May 2021. So 2022. And at that time, things were still shut down. So we didn't do the outdoor thing, uh, stage because we can't whatever. Long story short, it was too risky. So mm -hmm. we just kept it indoors, which seems counterintuitive when there's a pandemic going on. But uh, it's easy to cancel <laughs> that. So you can cancel if right. you have to. Right. Um, and uh, so that was way less difficult. Also, because most of the artists were already confirmed from uh, the previous year, from 20, actually two years ago, from 2020. Our headliners still played Propagandi and, uh, and Good Riddance still uh, wanted to do this, the festival. Some of those couldn't, but uh, those guys were still in. So we, we already had that preset. So that was pretty easy. But normally, when you're doing the outdoor stage, and you're also dealing with people, much like uh, music for cancer, we're not a, we're not doing it for charity, but no one's getting paid just because it's mm -hmm. there's just no money at Pusa to pay people. Um, that's not. So you get a lot of volunteers it's, it's getting paid, and the sound guys are getting paid, and you know that kind of stuff getting paid. But there's tons of volunteers, so you you have some people that get you know a little distracted after a while, and ultimately they're really volunteering because they want to see some band play, mm -hmm. which is great. You want them to be music fans, but sometimes people just disappear, and you're like, where did everybody go? <laughs> We have a situation, um, but when we had some great people work in at the fest, you know, we have people that work for Van Gogh, which is the big production company here that will do that weekend with us. We have people that run independent festivals across the country doing uh, hospitality. Our hospitality guy is absolutely amazing. He just did Ride Fest. He was just down <clears throat> in uh, California doing some other ones. He's, he's outstanding. So we have really good people that do work, but inevitably because of the nature, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a like, hold on to your seats because here we go. It's Pooza. Everyone else has got real jobs and let's see what happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I hear you. Yeah, I love it. I'm hoping we go back outside. 
but it is a commitment to do so. You know, like we really have to have our stuff together. And at this point, uh, it, it was, we're going to find out. I think my PUSA meeting is actually next week. So we will find out what we're doing. Awesome. Awesome. Fun. Always love PUSA Fest. It's so much fun. And yeah, before should. we go, I know we're getting short on time. I know you want to, <laughs> uh, I'm excited for music for cancer. We'll, we'll take yep. it one step at a time, but, um, uh, excited to see you guys play. So you guys play a few bands before us. That means yep. actually that's a good thing for me because, because yep. if it's the band right before, it's always a little harder to, to watch, you know, got to warm up and all that. But, um, if you need a little help with, with vocals, let me know. Maybe I'll, I'll pop up. Oh man, that'd be rad. That'd be really fun. <laughs> Let's talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No pressure I mean, to do our version. Don't worry. <laughs> it's, it's, it's probably a better version. I got to be honest. I mean, I'm gonna, I, after this is no, done, no, it's I'm just, actually going to email it to my bandmates. But of course, I'll be like, hey, guys, you know, keep this under wraps. Yeah, well, you know, we, we'll, sh we'll probably try to release it, you know, the week of or something. And we'll let you know, of course. Um, and everybody's listening to this right now. So they're going to know we're going to release it at some point. But uh, we just wanted to make your song that's amazing. And I love the message behind it. We just wanted to make it sound like an MXPX song. And man, so that's kind of what we tried to do. So. Oh, man, it's so cool. Thank you for doing that. I really do appreciate it. It's uh, it truly for me, it's an honor. So, you know, that you did that effort to, and you make you made it sound really good. Sneaking that change in from the other tune. Brilliant. Gotta be honest. I'm relieved that you like it. I'm relieved. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Is it you who's doing most of the production on that? Um, me and Tom Chichilla yep. and and the band really i mean we're really? we, we just come it's back team effort yeah we come back and and i i mean i kind of forced them like let's try this let's try this but they're yeah. always like yeah let's try it as many ways so we'll like try one part like the chorus fast we'll try it like motown fast we'll try it mid-tempo we'll try you know like we'll try it all the ways right and That's this is great. what we came up with so hey man keep enjoying music you're doing a great job yeah Dude, thanks for All being right. on. Um, I'll see you in September 17th. Or, well, I'll definitely see you September 17th. If not, maybe I'll see you that, that Friday before the 16th. Right on, um, If we get in. And they don't, hopefully they don't keep us stuck at the border too long. I'm, I'm, I'm very optimistic. I'll just send Costa down. and <laughs> Please do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. You be good. See you soon. All right, see you, Matt. Cheers. Thanks. thanks. Bye.